Hey, we have a pretty awesome God, would you agree? <laughs> All right, you guys can be seated. Thanks so much for being here today. We're in a series, we're talking about relationships, and recently I've had two situations that have reminded me about disagreements and how to handle those disagreements, and both of them center around soccer games. So my old daughter, she's here today, she plays soccer, and a few weeks ago we were at our home field, and a guy kind of beside us was being very vivacious and loud, and he was part of the other team, you can imagine. And uh, at some point, he was yelling at the refs and players and everybody, and, and I kind of looked over at him, and I said, calm down, man, calm down. And my wife kind of nudged me, well, actually, she hit me, and she said, you can't talk to an adult like that. <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah, maybe I can't. And so that was story number one. Story number two, similar was we were at a soccer game and we happened to be sitting right in the spot where the game was decided. A few calls were right in front of us and, and a few of them were just bad. I mean, just really bad calls. And so I was vivacious that day, okay? And I was so vivacious that the ref on that line went to the coach of our team and said, hey, you need to calm that fan down over there. And uh, so again, it reminded me there is a great way to disagree, and there are some other ways to disagree. And so today we want to talk about how do we disagree and salvage the relationship? You see, we live in an era, you know this, we live in an era of disagreement. There are so many layers and levels and, and lines of disagreement. I mean, certainly we've seen that in so many areas of our world and our lives. I mean, there certainly are political disagreements. We, in our church, I, I'm actually proud of this. We, we have people of different political persuasions, but, but yet we, sometimes we disagree. Uh, certainly there are racial um, lines that are drawn, and, and uh, certainly this last year we've learned some lessons in this area. and We've kind of gotten some, some pr new perspectives on racial lines and, and how do you treat races properly and what is the best way to handle those. Uh, culturally, um, we, we just have lines there. I mean, all throughout our culture, we, we see these lines and, and they're just everywhere. As a matter of fact, this last year, who would have ever thought that a, a, a seven inch long, four inch wide piece of strip around your mouth would create so much disagreement? Who would have ever guessed that? I mean, who would have ever thought that that would be the case? Or this past week, how about this? Um, who would ever thought that we'd argue, can you carry gasoline in a plastic bag? <laughs> you know? I mean, there's so many levels and lines of disagreement. I mean, they're just, they're everywhere. And so it kind of becomes a skill for you and I to, to learn how do we disagree and salvage the relationship. I wrote this in my notes, until we're dead, we're going to have disagreements. Until we're dead, we're all going to have some kind of disagreement. It's estimated that in the workplace, it costs companies over $350 billion a year when it comes to conflict. If you were to add up the work stoppage plus the HR department time, it's over $350 billion a year that companies spend on disagreements. You see, it's going to happen. It's a reality for us. And again, the skill is how do we rectify broken or restrained or strained relationships? And here's the challenge. Nobody ever really teaches us how to do that well. Would you agree? I mean, it's not a class in school. You can't take um, conflict resolution 101. Um, we really, our parents, this might be a failure of, of parenting. Maybe we've not taught our kids how to, how to disagree and rectify or restore relationships. We, we just struggle with that, it, but it's a skill that we can develop. It's a skill that can come. It just takes work. It takes effort, and it takes faith. So let me give you three reasons why this matters, because you may be wondering, well, why are we talking about this in church today, and what does this really mean? Well, let me give you three reasons that this topic matters today. Why is it important that I learn to restore relationships? And here's number one, preserve my closeness with God. You see, you can't be right with God when you're wrong with others. It's impossible to be right with God and wrong with others. Or let me say it this way. It's very difficult to have a vertical closeness to God when horizontally you've got issues with people. 
So number one, our closeness, our, it preserves our closeness with God. Number two, it preserves critical relationships. <laughs> you see, as Christians, we realize that we don't just have throwaway relationships. You see, in culture, maybe that's a thing. Maybe it's okay to, to kind of blast someone and then don't worry about the relationship. But as Christians, that's not a thing. So number two, preserves critical relationships. And number three, it preserves my happiness. It preserves my happiness because when we have relationships that are strained or broken, it harms and hurts my happiness. You see, every broken relationship, every strained relationship that I have, it chips away at my happiness. It keeps me up at night. Or how about this? Maybe you've been here before. Maybe it makes grocery store shopping awkward because you run into the lady or you run into the guy that you have a strained relationship and you're kind of avoiding them or you're trying to figure out how do I talk to them or how do I avoid them? And it makes life tough. It preserves our happiness. So here's what I'd like for us to do today. I call it a conflict audit. And a conflict audit is we look at what do I need to do to restore some strained or broken relationships? What are some things that I can do? What are some steps that I can take to restore strained or broken relationships? If you have your Bible today or your outline, go ahead and grab that. We're looking at a story here in Galatians 2. We'll have it on the screen there as well. If you're joining us online Thank you so much for being here with us today, and I know we'll have the notes with you as well. But in Galatians 2, we, we pick up a story. Matter of fact, this is one of the most tense stories in the New Testament. It was a very turbulent moment in the life of the early church. And let me give you some background here. There were two factions that came together uh, kind of in that early church. You had the Jewish believers, and then you had the Gentiles. Now, I know in our world, we face some racial tensions and uh, man, we, we've seen that take place. Well, this was a racial tension as well. You see, Jews and Gentiles, they, they came from different backgrounds. They had different thoughts on the world. They ate differently, which we're going to talk about in a moment. And there was some racial tension. There was some tension going on between those two groups. So basically, they had the same God, but they had a different lifestyle. Maybe you relate to that today. We, we have differences of opinion and we have differences of, a, of the way we think and yet we have the same God. So as we go through this story, um, this faction began to grow and the Gentiles and the Jews were kind of fighting it out a little bit. And Paul noticed that Peter was doing something that he shouldn't do. We're going to talk about that in a moment. And Paul, the great Christian leader, calls out another great Christian leader named Peter. It says, Peter, you can't do what you're doing. You, you can't act like you're acting. And he reprimanded him for this um, very vividly. So you have two Christian heavyweights going at it. And basically, Paul looked at Peter and said, come on, man. Get your act together. I mean, get your thoughts together. Get your life together. Or this is going to mess up our relationship. Or this is going to mess up the Christian faith that we, you and I both are fighting for. So let me give you a phrase just to remember. I'd love for you to write this down. Here it is. The goal of the fight is to eventually make the relationship right. The goal of the fight is to eventually make the relationship right. Now, when I say that, I'm not talking about certain situations because I always want to remind people of this. We're not talking about abuse situations, maybe in a marriage or, you know, child molestation issues. We certainly are not talking about issues like that we're talking about just normal human interactions where there's a disagreement and ultimately the goal of the fight is to eventually make the relationship right so let's jump into this story here on your outline and let's notice what we find here we go but when Peter came to Antioch I had to oppose him to his face for what he did we'll come back to this was very wrong when he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of the criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, the other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. We'll come back to that word hypocrisy as well. And even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. When I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of the, all the others, 
Since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? You and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles, yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law, for no one will ever be made right by, uh, with God by obeying the law. And so what you find here, let me give you point number one before we jump in, is focus on the issue, not the person. Focus on the issue and not the person. And that's what Paul does here because he had a real problem. Maybe you've been there before where you have a real problem with somebody and you have every right to confront them. And by the way, let me just go ahead and get this out of the way. Um, it's okay to disagree with people. It's okay to confront people. It's okay to have issues with people, and sometimes those need to be hashed out. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. But look what Paul says to Peter. He said, you were very wrong. You were very wrong. You say, well, what was he wrong about? Let me give you just kind of the scene here, because, again, you had two groups of people coming together, and they were kind of living life together. I mean, they came from different backgrounds, but they had the same guy. And so when they came together, um, one of the most difficult parts of their relationship was mealtime. You see, they ate different foods. If you have ever learned about the Jewish culture or been around a Jewish friend, you sometimes notice that they eat kosher uh, foods. Well, the Gentiles didn't care about kosher foods. It didn't matter a whit to them. And so the Jews would try to eat kosher and the Gentiles would not. Well, that frustrated Peter. <laughs> I mean, that got on his nerves. Uh, I mean, Peter just really didn't like the Gentiles eating whatever they wanted to eat. He, he found that offensive. And so what Peter would do when mealtime came, maybe you've seen this in the lunchroom when you were in school. I have. Uh, but when he would go to sit down to eat and a Gentile would come, he would get up and move to the next table. That's what Peter would do. You see, Peter would make a scene of the fact that he didn't want to eat with the Gentiles. And that was a problem. Because the message that he was sending was this, that God loves you, Gentile, but I cannot eat with you. Again, maybe you saw that in the lunchroom. I, I've seen it before. Have you ever sat down at a table and maybe there were other people there and about the time you sat down, somebody got up and left? You ever been there? I mean, that's, that's tough. Or, or maybe you've seen just uh, someone that didn't like your race or maybe they didn't like your belief system and they... They just moved on. They, they couldn't care for you. They, they would say that God loves you, but I'm not going to sit with you. God loves you, but I'm not going to eat with you. And Paul used a word in this passage, and you, we've heard this word before. It was the word orthopedia. Orthopedia. We know what an orthopedic surgeon is, right? An orthopedic surgeon is one that straightens a bone. How many of you ever had a bone that wasn't straight? It got out of whack. I know you have, Ross. Um, yeah, you have these bones and they get out of whack and, and the orthopedic surgeon comes in and he fixes them, right? That's his job. Well, well, that's what Paul said to Peter. He said, man, your life is out of joint. Uh, your life is out of, out of scale. You're, you're out of line here. And basically what he says to Peter is your walk doesn't match your talk. Peter, you'll talk about how, God, how great God is. You'll talk about how great God is in your life, but you're going to treat these people terribly. I mean, you're going to, just going to treat them like they're throwaways. You can't do that. You see, as Christians, we learn you can't, we, we can't do that with people. And so what did he do? He focused on the issue. He came at the issue, not at the person. And again, we said the goal of confrontation is to restore the relationship. You see, in all of our relationships, the ultimate goal should be to restore those relationships. By the way, this was not attack on, an attack on Peter. This was a defense of Jesus. You see, because it offends Jesus when we treat people in a way that they shouldn't be treated. And that was, that was what Peter saw. Let me tell you something I found this week fascinating. And our brains are set up to handle situations in different ways. There's two parts of our brain um, that come into play when we argue with people, when we disagree with people. The first part of our brain that comes into play, normally it's the first thing our brain goes to. It's the cortex. And the cortex, we think logically 
and we think in a linear fashion. And uh, it's, it's the place where we are able to talk to someone with facts. However, when that doesn't work or we just kind of move to the next level, the next part of our brain is called the limbic region. In the limbic region, it comes into play when we get angry or scared. And you see, in the limbic region, we go off on people. <laughs> How many of you ever spent some time in the limbic region of your brain? Well, God wired us in such a way that when we stay in the cortex part of our brain, we handle situations well. We think logically, we think in a linear fashion, and we come with the facts. We come with the info. But the problem is when we move to the limbic part of our brain, which is a legitimate part, it's the fight or flight part of our brain. When we get there, listen, that's when we do people wrong. Have you ever been so right that you were wrong? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you knew you were right what you said, and you knew the confrontation was right, but the way you did it was wrong. <laughs> but you see, Peter handled this well. He handled it right. He focused on the issue and not the person. And he realized that the ultimate goal was to restore the relationship. Look at her point number one. He said, for what he did was wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentiles believers who were not circumcised. But afterward, when some friends came of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. Look at this word. He was afraid of criticism. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. So what do we find first that... Paul focused on the issue and not the person. Paul was able to do this, and we're going to find out in a few moments, in such a way as to restore the relationship. Number two, confront privately and face-to-face -face if possible. Confront privately and face-to-face -face if, po if possible. In this story, we notice that he, he does confront both publicly and privately, but, but we learn in Scripture that one of the best moves we can make is to confront people privately, and we'll talk about that here in just a moment but look what it says when Peter came to Antioch I had to oppose him to his face <laughs> he said listen this was so egregious I couldn't stand back and watch uh, what what Peter was doing was so wrong and I couldn't just stand back and let it go and maybe you're there today maybe you have a relationship with someone that um, you're in that position where they're just wrong and you're trying to handle it well and, and properly, and you want to handle it well, and you want to handle it properly, but you got to confront. I don't know about you, but one of the last things I want to do with people is confront them. One of the last things I want to do is, is come to someone in their face and tell them what I think. But yet there's a time for that. There's a moment for that. But there's also, as we're finding out here, there's a way to do that. I'd love for you to write this down. This is one of the best things I've ever followed or one of the best plans I've ever followed for confrontation. Here it is, correct in private and praise in public. Correct in private and praise in public. You see, we said the ultimate goal is to restore the relationship. The ultimate goal is to have the relationship intact at the end. One of the best ways to get there is to correct in private and praise in public. Don Shula was a great coach of the Miami Dolphins. One day he was talking to a reporter about a player's mistake at practice. He said this, we never let errors go unchallenged. Uncorrected errors multiply. The reporter said, isn't there a benefit to overlooking the small errors of a player? Shula said, what is a small flaw? He said, I think about that all day long. What is a small flaw? He said, I see it in my children. He, he said... I think about it with them quite often, but here's what he said. Um, but uncorrected errors multiply. You, you've got to face them someday. You might as well face them on the spot. He said this, if I could do it all over with my children again, I'd face errors on the spot. It's easier on them and easier on me. He said that works for relationships with anyone. If there's something under the surface that makes uh, something that makes you mad... You might as well just bring it out. Face it right then. 
You see, that's what Peter did. You see, there's a tendency for us when we have issues with people to, you know, in the South, we really want to just act like it's not there, right? I had somebody tell me, a lady that was from up north, she, she told me one day, she said, you Southerners don't know how to fight. You backbite, you talk to other people about the situation, but you won't talk to the person. I said, well, maybe you're right. But what we find here is that Paul had a problem with Peter. And he looked at Peter and he said, man, I confronted him to his face. I went right up to him and I told him, what I thought was right and what I thought was wrong. You see, again, ultimately, the relationship wants, needs to be restored. And we're going to find out in a moment that's exactly what happens. But let me give you a phrase to write down here. If you're not listening, you're not loving. You see, in confrontation, if you're not listening to the other person, then you're really not loving the other person. So number one, focus on the issue, not the person. Number two, confront privately and face-to-face if possible. Then number three, present the facts, not hearsay or opinion. Look what we find here on your outline. It says, as a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. And even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. When you see the word used there twice, it's the word hypocrisy. (laughs) That word hypocrisy is an interesting word in the scriptures. It's used quite often and it's a teaching that probably we all need at different times in our lives, but hypocrisy comes from an acting uh, world. And it means that you, in the acting world, you can play two different characters in the same play. My little boy was in a play a few weeks ago, and he was two characters in the play. You see, he went right behind this stage, and he changed, changed from one character to the other. And that's what Paul is saying here about Peter. He said, you put on different faces in front of different people. And he said, you look one way to this group and you look one way to that group. And he said said to Peter, really, you're an actor, Peter. I see you acting around one group and then acting around the other. And he said, that's not Christianity. (laughs) That's not faithful people. And then he said this, there's a danger. He said, other people followed you, Peter. You see, Peter was a powerful man. He was a titan in that early church. As a matter of fact, Peter had been around the church a lot longer than Paul had. Paul was the newbie. He was the new guy. And Peter had developed a name. He had developed a reputation. He was somebody that that people followed. And Paul was the new guy. And Paul saw something he didn't like. And we see that Peter does the wrong thing. But look again at these verses. It says, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. Even Barnabas was led astray. You see, Barnabas is one of these guys in Scripture. When we read about his life, he was a leader as well. Uh, Barnabas was very well respected. Uh, Barnabas was a guy that many people came behind and and, uh, followed and, and were very appreciative of Barnabas. Matter of fact, Barnabas is one of my favorite characters in the New Testament. His name means son of encouragement. Son of encouragement. You see, Barnabas, when people looked at his life, they said, you're an encourager. You lift people up. They looked at Barnabas' life and said, it's like an elevator. Some people take others down and some people take others up. Barnabas, you take people up. Barnabas, when people are around you, you lift them up. And yet we find here that Barnabas kind of fell into the, the fray and that Barnabas started to do the things that Peter had done as well. But I want you to see again, Paul did something that, that's crucial here. He came with the facts. He came with the facts. Let me say this, come with the facts or don't confront. You see, for us, if we don't have the facts, if we don't have the firsthand information, then we probably shouldn't confront. Uh, we probably shouldn't make the disagreement known. But Paul came to the face of his friend Peter, and they were friends. And he said, here's the facts. Here's what you're doing. I don't like what you're doing. Now, I told you earlier that this relationship, we think, was restored. And let me go to a guy named Eusebius. Eusebius is a historical uh, early church historian And he writes about many of the 
characters in scripture and he writes about the early church and what happened in, in that early church. And here's one of the things that he tells us about Peter and Paul's relationship. He tells us that they did ministry for many years after this. And in church history, we, we find that that's true. As a matter of fact, uh, Dionysus, the bishop of Corinth, said this, they taught together in like manner in Italy, and listen to this, Peter and Paul suffered martyrdom at the same time. <laughs> Let me tell you what that means. It means that Peter and Paul had a confrontation. Two titans that of the faith, people who, who walked in faith, people who believed in the same God, People who had the same view of the Savior, they had, a, they had a disagreement, they had a fight. And that fight caused upheaval with the other Christians at the time. And yet what we find, they ultimately came back together to do ministry. And the thing about that quote that really jumps out at me is they both were martyred about the same time. <laughs> Isn't that just amazing to think about? I mean, two men that have fought each other ultimately fought for the kingdom. Ultimately fought for the Savior. Ultimately fought for God and, and the work that God wanted to do in the world. And, and they ended up dying in a similar fashion at the same time. You see, we, we are all going to have disagreements. As a matter of fact, this week we're going to walk into some disagreements. You're going to, I'm going to. Uh, some of us come in here today and we have disagreements with other people. And you're looking at those situations trying to decide, how do I handle them? How do I best navigate this disagreement? My prayer for all of us today is that we'll take a look at this story. That we'll see the relationship between these two men and say, you know what, God? Can you help me handle it this way? God, can you help me handle our disagreements and, and handle our problems and, and handle our issues in the way that these two guys did? Because ultimately, they came together for the betterment of the faith. Let me give you a quote here by St. Augustine, and we're, we're going to come to a conclusion here in just a few moments. But this is St. Augustine, and I wanted to, to kind of just emphasize this quote because this is the life of a Christian today. And, and, and again, we're in a world of disagreement. Uh, we're not going to be able to avoid disagreement. And I, I, I would say this, that in the era of social media, there's no way to not see our disagreements. They're just all out in front of us. And so how do we handle those? St. Augustine many years ago wrote this, and I, I love this quote. Here it is. In essentials, unity. Meaning when it's these issues that are essential, hopefully we can find unity. In areas of faith, in areas of critical nature, we need to try to find unity. We need to come together. In non-essentials, meaning the things that don't really matter. By the way, that's one of the big decisions that you and I need to make when we argue with people. Is this an essential or a non-essential? Meaning what I disagree with you, is it an essential issue or is it a non-essential issue? I had a conversation with a lady this week and she was frustrated about something. And my question to her, is this an essential or a non-essential issue? And, and, and I actually, I knew the answer to that. It was a non-essential issue. But she, what she was trying to do is make it an essential issue. She was trying to make it a primary issue. So here we go. In essentials, we find unity. In non-essentials, we let's say this together. What's that word? Liberty. Let's say that again. Liberty. In non-essentials, we find liberty. That word you might want to write it down is freedom. You see, if something's not essential, guess what I have? Freedom. Uh, guess what you have if something is a non-essential? You have freedom. Meaning that if it's something to do with, and I, I might step in a landmine here, and I, I, God help me. Your political view, most of the time, is right there. Most of the time, your political, now, I, uh, listen, I understand there's some political issues that are essential. I get that. But most of our political views fall in that category right there. That's why if you're a Democrat today, I love you. If you're a Republican today, I love you. Because, 
Because in non-essentials, I got to give you what? Freedom. I can, and here, please, Jesus, help me not say something I shouldn't say today. <laughs> what I've got to be careful in my life, let me make it personal to me. If I try to make this, this, I get in a lot of trouble. And if I try to make that, that, I get into a ton of trouble. You see, when we flip-flop those two things, whether it's essential or non-essential, listen, we step on landmines all the time doing that. And one of the questions you got to ask yourself before you confront somebody, is this an essential issue or a non-essential issue? Or another way of saying it is, is this worth a fight? Is this worth a confrontation? Is this worth me getting on that computer and calling somebody out on Facebook? Is it worth it? In essentials, we try to find unity, meaning of faith, salvation, godliness, Man, those are essential. We got to get those right. In non essentials, liberty, freedom. And then, please, listen, this is for me, okay? Look at this last line. In all things, charity. Let's say that together. Charity. One more time. Charity. That is a, let's change it to a Christian word, okay? Um, St. Augustine was a Christian, but he didn't use the Christian word I would use right there. Let's change that to the word grace. Grace. So let me read it that way. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, grace. You see, when I come at you with a confrontation, when I have a disagreement with you, whether it's critical or not, and listen, that's what he was saying, and I totally believe this. Whether it's an essential or a non-essential, I still got to treat you with grace. There's no reason for me to come at you with hatred. There's no reason for me to come at you with animus. There's no reason for me to come at you with wrong words. No matter what you and I believe on these first two things, I've got to come at you with grace. I call this the grace face. And listen, in this era, in this world today, we all need a grace face. Because there are so many disagreements. There are so many lines of disagreement. There are so many minefields of disagreements. I've got to show you grace. And please, I'm going to ask you a favor. Please show me grace. <laughs> I, I, I ask my wife that from time to time. Please show me grace because I'm going to make some mistakes. And honey, I need your grace. Will you take that grace face with you today? Will you take that grace face with you this week? Because listen, we're all going to fall into disagreements this week. I mean, every week of our lives, we're going to have disagreements with other people. And uh, how do we manage those? How do we navigate those disagreements properly? And how through those disagreements do we, do we bring God glory, do we bring him honor, and do we bring him fame? I told you this earlier, the goal of our fight should be ultimately to make things right. I told you that these two guys, Peter and Paul, they had an all-out battle. They had an all-out war. And yet they were able to rectify their situation, to reconcile their situation and they fought hand in hand for the gospel for the rest of their lives. I told you this earlier, but to, to, to think about these two guys being martyred at the same time for their faith, ah, that's just so, so amazing. Two guys that have fought it out and had disagreements. And I, my guess is they really had alms between each other for a long period of time. They still walked throughout their lives with faith. They still kept their mission and if you were to go around to the world, you would see their names all over stuff, right? St. Paul's Cathedral, St. Peter's Cathedral, St. Paul's Hospital. I mean, we see it all over the place. These two guys are famous. They didn't give up. They didn't throw in the towel and say, I hate you, I'm done. They didn't treat each other with disrespect. They didn't unfriend somebody. They held it together. And God was able to use their relationship for his purposes. 
And I believe that God can do that with you and me, even though we're different. Listen, I'm so different than some of you in here today. I have such different political beliefs and cultural beliefs. and I mean, you know, (laughs) but it's okay because God can give me that grace face, that place of grace to treat you with respect and dignity and love. Let me close with a story. An angry man one day rushed into a museum in Amsterdam, the, the Ricks Museum in Amsterdam, and he knifed a Rembrandt painting, one of the most famous Rembrandt paintings called Night Watch. The people were disturbed, and this was Night Watch was a, just one of those, that, I guess, pieces of art you could never reproduce. Another man, a few months later, walked into St. Paul's Cathedral in Rome and he took a hammer to Michelangelo's The Pita, the painting The Pita. Well, there were meetings after those two events and people were trying to decide, how do we handle this? What do we do? I mean, two irreplaceable works of art. What do we do? They called in experts and they said, can you repair these two classic pieces of work. Experts said, we don't know if we can, we're not sure, but we will do everything we can. (laughs) With precision and the utmost care, these fixers came in and they began to work. And after their work was done, they showed their work to the experts and the experts were amazed at the restoration that had happened to those two works of art. You see, that's God's work in our lives. We have a tendency to take hammers and to take knives to relationships. I've done it. And yet through the power of faith, through the power of God, he can restore relationships that are broken, strained. So let me ask you a question. I'd love for you to bow your heads with me today for just a moment. Are there any relationships in your life that need to be restored? Are there any relationships that there's been disagreement, there has been arguments, fights that we need to restore? Because the beauty of what we're talking about today is we can disagree. And while we do that, we can salvage the relationship. You see, through the power of God and the Holy Spirit, that can be a reality. You see, when we fight, ultimately, we want to make things right. With every head bowed and every eye closed today, I just want to remind you that the relationship we need to make right, I guess the biggest, most important relationship would be that with our Savior, with Jesus. And you see, none of our relationships will be right until we're right with with God. If you've never made that relationship right, would you do it today? Simply in your own heart and mind, say something like this, Father, I'm a sinner, but today I'm putting my faith and trust in you. Save me a place in heaven when I die. If you're making that decision today, the Bible says that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. If you're making that decision today, I want to pray for you. If you're doing that online, please put it in the chat box. If you're making it live with us today, would you just slip your hand up and let me pray for you, anybody today? Slip your hand up. God bless you in the back. Anybody else? I want to be right with God. Anybody else? For the rest of us today, I want to close with this. I call it phone, phone call, text, or hug. Is there anybody you need to send a phone or call on the phone, text, or hug? When I thought about that this morning, there's some people I need to call, text, or hug. You see, we all have those disagreements. We all have those strained relationships. And through the power of Christ, through the power of faith, those can be restored. You say, how do you know that? (laughs) Well, I watched it with Peter. I watched it with Paul. I watched those two guys navigate their lives and continue to work for the kingdom, for the cause of Christ. And you can too. My prayer for all of us today is we're going to face those Lines of disagreement. Can we salvage a relationship? Can we restore it to where God 
want to be. Father, we thank you that you restored the relationship with us. You made it right. And Lord, we thank you that you can restore our relationships here on earth. You did that vertically and you can do that horizontally. Lord, we thank you that we do have relationships and that you give us people. And Lord, let us, we know we're going to disagree. It's going to happen for the rest of our life. Lord, let us salvage those relationships. Let us reconcile those relationships for the betterment of your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for that ability. We thank you for that power and that might that you give us. God, we're going to praise you and we're going to thank you. In Christ's name.